It's a lot of us, guys. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay. <laughs> all right. We are live and uh, joining you all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, no matter where you where, depending on where you are. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're live with uh, some folks on the research vessel Roger Ravel in the Gulf of California. Um, my name is Ken Costell. I'm the director of research communications of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm not in the Gulf of California, unfortunately. Uh, if you joined us on Friday, you learned a little bit about what the some of these folks are doing. Uh, today, you're going to learn about what life is like on a three week three week research expedition. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to this group of folks on 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 the screen to introduce themselves, uh, introduce what they're doing, and uh, and and show you around the ship. Take it away, everyone. Hi, my name is Osama Elian. I'm a fifth year graduate student uh, doing my PhD at Michigan State University in microbiology and molecular genetics. And I study hydrothermal vents like some of the ones here. Uh, hi, I'm Victoria Preston. I'm a grad student in the MIC Huey Joint Program. I'm uh, at the intersection of computer science and uh, physical oceanography. Hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian Krauss. I am a sixth year PhD student at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, I'm a sediment uh, geochemist, and I'm here as a helping hand and providing my expertise to all the other scientists. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Youngs. Um, I'm a research assistant in Dr. Anna Michelle's lab at Hui. Um, I work on plastics and dissolved gas sensors. Hi, everyone. My name is Yuna, and I'm a second year grad student um, at Harvard University. I study microbiology and natural environments, such as hydrothermal vents. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke Travis. I am a first year graduate student at Harvard University in the Gerges lab, and I study symbiotic relationships in the deep sea. And that's what I'm doing here on this cruise. All right, you guys have a video to show us, I, I, I imagine. Is that what you wanted to start with? Or do you want to start with um, the seafloor video? Uh, we can start with this video. Um, okay. We kind of went around and interviewed different crew members and different scientists and engineers working on the boat. Um, so yeah, we'll share our screen. Okay. Good morning, welcome to the bridge of the Roger Ravel. My name is David Merline. I'm the master of the vessel or captain. I've worked at Scripps for 37 years, going on 38. Which this is kind of the center of where everything happens with uh, operating the ship. Currently, uh, we're about to recover a CTD, if you look down there. CTD is one of our very important instruments. It measures conductivity, temperature, and density. And this particular CTD also has a methane sniffer, which is one of the major things we're doing uh, in this project, uh, developing uh, instruments to measure methane. My name is Heather. I'm the chief mate on the vessel. Uh, most of what I do is supervising and making sure that the ship is getting maintained um, and safety. Um, it's all about safety. My name's uh, Marvin Gomez, but uh, I just go by Gomez, Gomez when I travel. You know? And I'm the, I'm the OS, so like the ordinary seaman. Essentially, you know, uh, working my way up on the deck department to AD and all that. My name's Alberto Palacios Jr. I'm one of the mechanical technicians for Jason, and I sit in navigator seat for a little bit. Hey, I'm uh, Johnny Clifford. I'm the first engineer on board the Viper Bell. Pretty much in charge of training. Um, the other engineers, a couple of orders here and there. Um, I have some equipment that's assigned to me. I make the uh, AC. And uh, my other job is just to make the cheap up here. This is 
Bible, or I go by Bible. Um, my actual name is Kristen Wetzel. Um, so I'm a wiper on this vessel, which is an entry level position in the engine room. Um, so I kind of like assist everyone in the engine room from the oilers to the electrician. Um, and sometimes directly to the chief engineer, sort of like a learning by doing job, I would say. It's very dynamic. It's always changing. I get a new group of scientists every trip, and they're always asking me questions on how to utilize the ship. Always thinking outside of the box, so it's very challenging and always something new. It uh, keeps it exciting and interesting. Our galley, it's self serve, so you get your cutlery, grab your plate, then you get a wide variety of things to have for breakfast. There's Jay Erickson, our head chef, he's already working on the next meal. We get fresh fruit, yogurt, homemade granola. Sometimes they make homemade yogurt. You can watch movies in here and relax. This is where we do our yoga, the library. Lots of books. Roger Revell, who the ship was named after. That's his sword. He was the guy that started the Department of Oceanographic Naval Research. Here's the main mess area. Everybody's just finishing up breakfast, getting ready to go out to launch Jason, which is going to be the next thing. I'm on call 24 seven. So one of my favorite things to do is sleep. <laughs> so I usually work about it, probably the minimum 16 hours a day. And if I have time, I like to do yoga to stretch and flex and lower my stress amount or catch fish. When I catch fish, that really helps me uh, feel good. And then I like to cook fish. I'm getting a pretty good routine. I like to make sure I'm working out, reading a lot, naps. So it's very poker. Oh, my that one about balance for. Um, I also like doing ping pong too. Probably shouldn't, but I like to snack. <laughs> but I, on, on the flip side, I do make up for it by exercising. You know, in my other free time. But yeah, besides snacking and uh, exercise, I like just uh, you know, socialize, maybe with people, play board games, or you know, just watch a show. Played a couple board games. I've done more reading than I normally do at home, and I watch movies. Just reading. I watch bad television shows that I didn't have the time to watch at home. So exercising and get some sun down here to see Cortez. I went to the Great Lakes Maritime Academy out of high school. I just decided I wanted to work on ships and travel and Let's see, I went to um Mass Maritime, uh Massachusetts of course. And uh, I graduated with a faculty degree in uh, there are other ways to do it too. You can start off as wiper. I come from tall ships, and this is my first research vessel or kind of industrial vessel. So on a tall ship, you would probably just call what the wipers and oilers do, engineering assistants or an engineer's assistant. Um, but yeah, I think I'm mostly called a wiper because I clean up after everyone else. Six years now, on and off, and OS, uh, 
Merch Mariner Convention with an OS designation a while ago, but this is actually my first time really using it in a, in a, in a job specifically for it. Try to see as much as you can in your sports center. If you want to be a travel, do the go to sea and travel and uh, work on a ship, you go to the Great Lakes or go to any academy. There's a bunch of academies, and that's the quickest route. And it was awesome knowing what I wanted to do when I graduated from high school and just like going into a program that was going to lead me exactly in that direction. So, um, see what I did. <laughs> no, it's a good life. Just uh, give it a try. Uh, doesn't have to do this. There's a lot of sailing. I, you know, I've done follow shows. You know, they're yachting. There's, you know, just some other guys do like just fishing. You know, there's all kinds of way to get into like uh, being a sailor. There's not one right way or wrong way. I just like trying a bunch of different things. And right now, being on recent vessels, you know, it's, it, it's working pretty well. I think I would tell the younger Bible um, about boats because. I didn't really get into sailing until five years ago, um, but I think if I had gotten into boats earlier, um, I would have figured things out about the industry a lot sooner and been farther along. But I also did a lot of other things with my life prior, so I can't complain that. That was great. Who put that together? <laughs> and who got to who got to ride in the small boat to get the 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 shots of the video of the nice. <laughs> you know, you, you asked everybody else what their career, what their pathway to going to sea was. What what are some of your pathways? How did you get to where you're at? <laughs> I uh, actually ended up in my PhD program sort of by accident. I was really interested in studying uh, the idea of habitability and how do we understand sort of by extension the evolution of life and the origin of life. And that led me to the graduate program that I'm in right now at Michigan State University with Dr. Matt Shrink studying hydrothermal vents as these really nice examples of what could have been happening on an early earth and what could be happening also on other planetary bodies. And what I didn't realize going into the PhD program, I thought I was going to sit there in a lab and do experiments. But two weeks after he said, sweet, you're joining the lab, he was like, all right, now you're going to see the samples. And that was a completely foreign idea to me. Um, so I packed up all my stuff and went to see for the first time a few years back. and. I've been working on that stuff ever since, and it's been sort of the best career job that I've ever had. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I, I guess um, for me, I've always been kind of close to nature. Um, growing up, my parents would always take me to the beach. Living in LA, we were actually relatively close, and so we had that luxury of visiting on summers, especially and. Um, I've always been drawn to that nature sort of thing and the ocean really calls. And so, of course, going to school, I, I went to the University of California, Santa Cruz, received my bachelor's in marine biology. Um, and after that, I started looking for jobs that involved more marine research and landed up at the University of Southern California, um, working as a research assistant, much like what uh, Sarah is doing. Um, and then eventually I you know, began to realize that I really wanted to pursue a higher level of education and um, UCLA calls. And uh, my, my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Tina Troida, gave me a chance, uh, even though despite some of my deficiencies in, in my education, um, she's really helped and fostered and nurtured my, my route to where I am right now. And so now I get to be on these awesome research vessels meeting 
awesome people, great senior scientists, and of course, my fellow colleagues are all in the same developmental stages. Yeah, so um, I'm a robotics engineer by training. That's what I did in undergrad. And while I was an undergraduate, I was very fortunate to have an advisor who was very excited about expeditionary robotics. So putting robots in extreme environments and having them do something interesting. And in that process, we collaborated with scientists who were interested in studying whales non-invasively. So could we fly drones uh, through whatever comes up when a whale breathes at the surface, you know? And that was my first exposure to this idea that, oh, robots can be tools for scientists and not just tools for scientists in a lab setting. You know, you think about maybe automated lab machinery, but actually in the field. Um, and so I wanted to figure out where that path would take me. I'm really excited about the opportunities in environmental science. So here I am, <laughs> never expected to go to sea, never expected to have um, a not traditional desk job as a computer scientist, uh, but I'm really excited about it. Well, yeah, like Sebastian, um, when I was younger, I just loved to be outside and really cared about the environment. Um, so in undergrad, I studied chemistry and environmental science. Um, I also really liked to build things when I was younger. Um, so once I graduated, I actually taught at a science school for a little while and loved that and then kind of switched paths and came to Huey. Um, really fortunate to work in a lab where I can kind of use my chemistry skills and then also do a bit of engineering at the same time. Um, I also studied computer science um, in undergrad and um, that's when I really became introduced to the uh, idea of um, uh, genomes or genomes as the source code for life. And, and then I became really interested in origin of life and um, astrobiology, um, really understanding how life came about um, and how life was coded into these um, elaborate um, genomes. And, um, and then uh, I got really into deep sea bio because of my interest in um, astrobiology. And then here I am doing more deep sea stuff <laughs> with uh, um, my advisor, yeah. And like um, Sarah and Sebastian, I was also interested in the ocean from a very young age. And I went to Cornell to study marine biology. However, Ithaca is quite landlocked. So um, <laughs> you know, I wasn't able to go out and get samples every day for my research. So when I met Pete, it was kind of a great way to, um, you know, come out to the ocean and really be hands on in this like field like environment. And that's one thing you do in the deep sea, right? You have to do these long excursions to get the kind of samples that you want. Um, so it's been a great experience. Okay, building on that, I was I was very happy to to hear that you 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 went to school in Cornell. There's somebody on the ship who went to Great Lakes um maritime academy so as as an indiana boy i gotta ask is there anyone else uh, uh, in, on the screen either from the midwest or not from the coast <laughs> where osama uh michigan detroit all right so there is a there is a way for for some of us from who are who are marine marine limited to get out onto the ocean um, you, uh, Yuna and Osama, both of you mentioned a connection to astrobiology and to the, ex to, well, I'll let you talk about that because I think that's a really neat, uh, aspect of what you're doing. How does, what is astrobiology and how does what you do link us to what might be out there? Yeah. So astrobiology really thinks about, um, uh, what life would be like if we found life outside of Earth. Um, so there's a bit of a joke that astrobiology is kind of, um, we're sort of studying something that we don't even know exists yet. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of um, the th questions that we ask is um, uh, what kind of um, environments um, could life be found in? Um, if we are designing space explorations, um, say for instance, to um, uh, have the, in planets in habitable zones and um, what kind of energy uh, drives life, um, what kind of requirements should we be looking for? And, uh, and frankly, what 
and the instruments should we be sending out to space in order to detect signatures like? I, I think you know, really made a, a good summary of it. And sort of to give it a little bit more of a multi-year perspective, there were always these theories about exotic chemistries that life could use uh, to sustain itself. And hydrothermal vents like the ones we're studying on the screws were only relatively recently discovered after being hypothesized to exist in the 70s onwards. And since then, hundreds of different types of hydrothermal vents have been found that either exist because of chemical reactions that provide the necessary food for life or because of power generated from magma below the surface that also helps provide those uh, chemistries for life. So if you kind of think about this from a multi-planetary kind of universal scale, the number of necessary ingredients for life to be around um, always gets adjusted and become a little bit more universal. So a lot of these processes that we see in the ocean can be found maybe on the subsurface of Mars or in the ocean worlds like Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, or Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. And to extend it further, uh, a lot of the great work that uh, 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 these really smart sensor folks are doing to detect these chemistries and isotopes uh, can be applied to those exploratory missions in the future if we were to send a probe or a lander to sniff all that chemistry that's in the ocean and see how similar it is to the stuff that we're seeing here. Um, I think one of the cooler things also about astrobiology is um, maybe not necessarily how exotic the processes are, but how familiar they are and how consistent they are. And of course, they're based on an N of one, a planet where we found life. So uh, I think that's fairly exciting in terms of the universal potential for either the continuous origin of life in an infinite universe or uh, the spread of life and its sustainability. Um, that I think that, that's a phenomenal point to make. It's an N of one. So the more we learn about this planet, the more we learn about what might be or what are the options are to be looking for. And people uh, who are tuning in might not know that, you know, even though we know we haven't, we only have, we have one example of life in the solar system, but we have many examples of oceans that we're only just discovering. And Osama, I think you just, you pointed that out of, um, uh, um, under ice oceans in Europe and Enceladus and many, many other places it's turning out. Um, I wanted to jump quickly to a couple of comments we're getting over on YouTube. Uh, first of all, some family check-ins. Uh, the Krauss family and the Travis family are tuning in and say hello. Um, and one of, one of them is asking uh, to tell us a little bit more about the room you're in. go um yeah this is our big computer lab um so the screens you're seeing behind us have all sorts of data but we use um some of these screens for the ctv cast which you kind of saw in that video where the captain was showing it going overboard um so yeah you can usually see like live data from the ctv what depth it's at um, yeah there's like a video screen of century one of the auvs on the board here so yeah, it's kind of just a place where you can check in on a bunch of different things going on on the ship. And it looks from that um, that camera feed that you guys are underway. Are you uh, headed uh, back to port now? No. no, we're headed to a different spot um, to actually run a CTD. Uh, so we'll transit there and then pause there and do some more science. Okay. Um, now you guys uh, sent some video. Did you want to talk about that? The uh, the underwater video that you sent. I can share it. It might be a little bit smoother if uh, if I share this one. Okay. Oops, I got a can't. Hang on, just a second. I got a, and I'm gonna have to. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you see it running? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Tell me if you want to pause it at any time, but go ahead and, and tell us what we're taking a look at. 
So that's a, a black smoke or we're seeing here. Um, so this uh, <laughs> black smoke and um, it's um, it has a lot of chemicals. Oh, well, excuse me, really fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> sorry, it's short. So I'm just backing it up. Oh, okay. So um, is it just like a sequence of different? Okay. Um, so this, so we uh, sampled around um, and um, going in, well, so there are these chimneys, they're hydrothermal vents, um, and this uh, is a, uh, and we've been um, testing different instruments on, on these chimneys, and this is another chimney potentially, we can't see the whole picture yet. Um, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can talk about it. Yeah, yeah here in this um, little clip here, we have some interesting biology happening, which you may or may not be able to see. Um, well, back there, there was a few <laughs> tube worms, uh, which had those red-like plumes. Yep, there they are, um, and some white tubes. And we have some scale worms, which are the little red dots almost that uh, kind of cover the chimney surface. And that's kind of what uh, my role is on the ship, is just look at that biology and answer some very interesting questions about their molecular metabolisms. And I'm gonna let it roll. Oh God. <laughs> I, I think there's something particularly interesting just in general with those different clips is, uh, in that each one of those sort of represents basically a fairly complicated ecosystem that forms just around those hydrothermal vents. So if you've seen some other deep sea videos where you're roaming around the sea floor, it looks relatively barren to the naked eye, though there's a lot of stuff happening there microbiologically and chemically. And then when you come across these hydrothermal vents, suddenly you see things like crabs, tube worms, you have a lot of bacteria that are growing on the outside of the chimneys. You have a lot of these worms that are sort of in coexistence with the other um, animals and, and microbes that are in there. And actually the tube worms are a perfect example of this sort of complex ecosystem where they provide a beautiful home for some of these microbes to use sulfides that come out of those black smokers and in return also uh, provide the tube worms with energy and uh, life sustaining activities. Um, so it's, it's sort of a very wonderful example of how uh, special those hydrothermal systems are, what kind of chemistry and food they could provide to life and also beautiful pictures that we could share with you guys. Something really exciting about this cruise is that we have a mix of folks from lots of different disciplines. So we have biologists, we have geologists, and we have folks who are sort of at that borderline of physical oceanography. And so you're seeing these vents and you're seeing these ecosystems and we've been able to go down there and physically sample them. You're looking at video where we actually went and saw them with a big ROV. We've also been thinking about things underneath the sediment. So we've been sticking probes in to try to understand what Forms these things. And then we've also been flying things above them. So we've been taking the AUV sentry, flying above and sort of asking the question, well, if all this fluid is coming out, if all of this fluid is transporting, you know, stuff, nutrients into the midwater, where does it go? What is it feeding? How far does it go? Uh, so it's really exciting that we're going to get to collect samples on all of these different scales. And to also, you know, add to what Victoria is saying is that, you know, she mentioned that we're a big group of interdisciplinary you know folks and so we're talking about life at sea and part of life at sea is actually having lots of discussions right we all have something to bring to the table quite literally at dinner we could be talking about all kinds of different science right and bouncing around ideas and so that's something that i've actually really enjoyed on this cruise is getting everybody's different perspective you know you you often are thinking about one little thing right i play with mud right i just stick to mud right so what are people thinking about the water column, right? Or the, the, the crazy temperatures that you're seeing out of these uh, plumes and the electronics. And so it, it, I think when we're talking about life at sea, there's also that part of collaboration and talking through problems and coming up with solutions. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, that's a really good point to make is that, you know, when you're there, you're hyper-focused and you're surrounded by all these other people who are, are, are Hyper focused in lots of different areas, and you get to uh, very often. This is the place where new, new avenues of research, new collaborations are born. Is when you're on the on the ship, and you're you're just you know just an enclosed little bubble of 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 science and engineering for that 
that period of time at sea. How many of you are first time sailors? What's, uh, <laughs> what has what surprised all of you the most? I guess I can go. Um, I think I've been surprised by the crazy hours. We have <laughs> different watches. Um, so I'm on the 4 a.m. watch. So I have a nice wake up at 3.30 every morning. So it's kind of like 24 hour science operations here, which maybe not everyone knew. I don't think I really understood before I got here. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of like sleep when you can, work a lot. And um, I think also making time to have a little fun. We play ping pong. and board games and try to do something to relax a little bit too during the day. Yeah, I think the thing, um, one of the things that surprised me the most was how uh, close I would get to everyone on, on board um, because you see these people pretty much 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, but getting close to, all, you know, to so, so many amazing people um, who study so many different things and hearing their stories, learning about them, it's definitely adding like more perspective uh, to my life. So I definitely have enjoyed meeting everybody. And I, I got to ask this because people are always surprised um, that, that so many, uh, or maybe, maybe people don't know this, but a lot of ocean scientists actually get seasick. Are, have any of you guys uh, felt the effects? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what do you what do you do to 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 calm it? Saltines. <laughs> prescription patches. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of us are wearing the patches right now. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, I know I know several very you know very successful ocean scientists who just they they get on the ship and they're just sick as sick as a dog but they muscle through. Um, does for you guys does does going out on deck help? Seeing the the horizon move or do you hide from that? It helps. I go outside or I lay down and sleep because <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole thing that really helps me. It's just laying down mm -hmm. how about you guys yeah same, same. yeah <laughs> I, I think the the one kind of cool thing that has come out of this experience and other experiences too is just how helpful everybody becomes especially when people start feeling sick so uh we may be of different disciplines overall but very quickly through the cruise people start filling in temporarily for other folks and then you're learning a little bit about engineering a little bit about riftia a little bit about lenses of plumes on 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 uh, sentry and such so I, I think the camaraderie especially when people are feeling seasick definitely helps the seasickness go away when it hits yeah so along sort of branching off from that somebody on on youtube is asking are you all working on the same research project or an independent project um i'd say we all kind of have independent projects uh, like Spech or like Osama said we all kind of help each other but for example my group is building uh, different dissolved gas sensors so we built a methane sensor and a dissolved inorganic carbon sensor that we send down on the vehicles um, so we do a bit of that uh, Victoria and our group here is also doing something with plumes but a little different lens um, yeah these guys can explain what they're doing too <laughs> yeah um, I'm collecting uh... Uh, data for, well, my, I'm collecting samples for um, DNA sequencing to understand how microbes evolve in these systems. Um, but because we are sort of doing work in the same system, um, we can sort of see how like Victoria's data or Genevieve's data can um, help me process my data and give them a good picture and vice versa. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, and even though I'm in the same lab as you know, I am on a different project. Um, so I am here to study Riftia, uh, the two worms you saw earlier, and hoping to answer some questions about how the microbes living inside them can feed them energy. Um, and that relationship is what I'm looking into. And, uh, I'm actually studying the microbes that live in and around the actual chimneys, physically in the chimneys, and trying to understand how they structure themselves in that extreme environment with trying to come up with a little bit of an idea of how that affects their long-term evolution and survival on these systems. But 
to do that, I also need a lot of the data that these fine folks are generating. So it's not a completely isolated project. And I think the reality is the scale of the questions we're asking can't be done in isolation alone. You know, I think the best sort of science gets done when you have large teams that can come together, collaborate effectively, uh, and share data and share resources. Um, being on a cruise is not cheap. Uh, you know, it's amazing that we can have lots of different groups here to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. As a quick funny anecdote, uh, uh, a lot of uh, investigators on this cruise and other cruises that are studying these systems have also been studying this when they were grad students and they were grad student colleagues. So uh, that just sort of shows you the scale of the problems and how long it takes to kind of look at these problems, especially that we're inheriting it from, from our advisors and, and working on it as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And it, and I should say, the, the footprint of what you're doing extends well out from the ship. You're, are you, I imagine you guys are gathering samples and data for other people back on shore who couldn't be on board or there's not enough space. Um, we have a question also on YouTube about sort of um, dipping back into the, the concerns of those of us back on shore. Um, did you guys have to quarantine for ahead of time? We, we sheltered in place for seven days, um, took uh, COVID tests, and then when we were on board, we were actually wearing masks for 14 days, um, and we just got off the masks Saturday. Saturday. Oh, wow. <laughs> just in time to transit home and put them back on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I know you, you guys mentioned... Um, um, the intensity of the time that you spend, you know, your, all your waking hours um, or most of your waking hours working. Tell me a little bit about the watch cycle you're on and what do you do when you're not um, doing something specifically related, related to your scientific duties? Sure. So we have a four hour watch um, and we have sort of rotations assigned with that. And when we say watch, we specifically mean science watch. So when the ROV Jason is diving, so it's at the seafloor, it's collecting those beautiful videos you saw. Um, we, some subset of us needs to be in the room at all times, recording what's going on. You know, uh, you know these dives can last you know, easily multiple days. And you, know, you start your dive with a couple push cores and you know, 10 hours later, you have no idea where you were when you did it. You don't know how many, you don't know which where you need those data loggers, those video loggers in the room. And so when we're on watch, there's two of us and one of us is doing data logging, one of us is doing video logging. And when we're not on watch, what do we do? <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> I mean, for example, Victoria and I are on the uh, 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. shifts, right? So maybe we're doing science in the, in the daytime and then we have to sit on watch from 12 to 4 a.m. And so, you know, like right now, I'm still spooling up to, from that watch. But, um, you know, so sleeping, reading, um, ping pong sometimes, eating, that's important, eating. Um, <laughs> stargazing. Stargazing, that's also been really fun. Do um, you guys have anything that you guys have been doing? Um, I've been doing yoga every day, and that's been nice. Um, I also like to sit outside when I can, there's lots of wildlife. We've seen dolphins and whales. We saw a cool little water spout the other day. So there's kind of always something you're missing if you're inside. So I like to sit outside and just kind of watch when I have the time to do so. Okay, about food. How's the, how's the food? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I was when I'm at sea, I usually have to put myself on short rations at some point. I'd stop eating breakfast or some other thing. Are you guys, <laughs> how are you managing your food intake? Because I can, I can overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> the food has been absolutely phenomenal. And I think if you would like to place value on the most important folks on this ship, it is the cooks who work from 530 in the morning until the last dirty dish is yep. in the, uh, and they've done an absolutely phenomenal, priceless job on the food. It's been amazing this whole time. Probably the food is way too good. That's probably an actual problem. <laughs> we, had a, we had another question. Uh, uh, favorite 
favorite sea creature anyone octopus, octopus. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> The squid the, is cool. We've seen squid sort of fly like near the ship. It's been neat. Really? Any rays? Okay. Hey, you seeing any rays leaping out of the water? I remember that from yeah. being in the Gulf of California. Um. Okay. So you you you. Told us what what your career paths were so far to get to where you're at. What did what advice would you have to uh, any of the young people who might be tuning in to to about how they could get to where you are one day? I would say you know start early, thinking about what you'd like to do with yourself, and it doesn't really matter what that is, but as long as you have a passion for something, I think you should go and chase it. Um, it's not always easy. In fact, it's probably hard most of the time. And sometimes you have to learn the hard way. I certainly have done that. That's been a big thing about my uh, path. But I think um, one thing is just to persevere. If you really, really, really want it, um, and that's something that you that makes you happy in life, then you have to stick through it. You have to push through and find the right people or find the right resources um, and all that good stuff to help you get there. Um, because it's not always, you know, there, there are some times where things fall into your lap, that, that happens, but it's not always the time and you can't always count on that. Um, so finding, finding those resources, reaching out and, and putting yourself out there is what I would say. I would say, uh, be curious, stay curious, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And also don't be afraid to be wrong. I think a lot of science is these open-ended questions. We might have a hypothesis and we collect the data set. And it's like, well, that was unexpected. And be open to that, uh, I think is a big part of having a science mindset, whether or not you end up being a scientist. I think I would say don't be afraid to switch paths a bit too. Um, I think nowadays in college, you kind of get on one path and you think that's the only way to go. Um, but there's a lot of cool jobs out there and a lot of amazing people to meet. And so I think it's also okay to switch around a bit, see what you like, try different things. Yeah, I think that's I a... I... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. this um... is all about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I would say um, a big piece of advice, kind of with what uh, Sebastian was saying, is to be proactive about um, the kind of interests that you're uh, that you're passionate about. Um, so, you know, if you go to a lecture uh, from a professor that does research up your alley, you know, make sure to email them prior and you know introduce yourself and read their papers and just start learning and being a little bit more aware of how these interests make you feel. And then through that kind of trial and error process, I think you'll land in a good position for yourself. I like that point. I like the, the, the idea that, that of not being afraid to be wrong and using that, those opportunities to explore places that you have the opportunity to learn. And it, and it even goes with your, your career path. I mean, I started in mechanical engineering and then at some point I said, well, I don't even know what an engineer would do. So I switched to photography and then journalism and, you know, every, and every so often they let me go to sea. So heck, <laughs> um, a little bit more about, um, the, the cruise you're on. Um, what, what has surprised you the most either scientifically or, or, you know, about the, uh, about life, life on the ship. I mean, I'll say scientifically and then something about life. So it's this site has been fairly well studied uh, over the past few years, and it still always boggles my mind how you could go down in Jason and start roaming around looking at things and still be surprised at something new. Um, and everybody kind of scratches their head at like, well, this doesn't make sense. What is this? And it's been kind of a very interesting uh, feeling that for something that's you think has been fairly well studied inside and out, you're still a little surprised by it. Um, 
and as far as ship life, um, I think the one pleasant thing that I've, I found surprising is how excited, well, that's not surprising, but also pleasantly consistent is that everybody is very excited to share what they're working on and they're very willing to let you in on their little world. And I guess this is sort of a feature of scientists. We're always geeked out to talk about what we're working on. And that's been very eye-opening as far as the array of possibilities for things you could do with sensors or knowledge that you didn't know about Riftia tube worms or uh, geochemistry and isotopes. And it's, it's just been a very delightful experience uh, being able to just sit on the deck drinking a cup of tea at 2 a.m. in the morning, sort of still dazed from watch and be able to talk science or philosophy or life or things like that. I think another thing that's been kind of awesome is the, the Sea of Cortez. Somebody told me just before this cruise that it's a truly magical place. And I've definitely felt that way. I mean, you just go walk outside uh, for the sunsets have been mind boggling. And then just the other day we were sitting out and a cold front came up and a water spout just decided to show up and manifest, you know, and like monarch butterflies flying off the boat. It, it, I don't, it, it's really hard to describe, but the, this whole adventure here, this voyage to the Sea of Cortez has just been truly magical. Um, I'm not sure if my colleagues have felt the same way, but that's certainly how I felt. Um, I think one thing I've really enjoyed about ship life um, is being able to meet so many awesome crew members. Uh, we introduced you to some of them in that video, but there's many more on board here. And just hearing their insights on things, um, they know about a lot of the science we do too from being out here. Um, so I think I've really enjoyed getting to know a whole new group of people with different career paths, um, yeah, sharing their insight. Yeah, I think one thing scientifically that has surprised me is how dynamic these sites are on the seafloor. As Osama was saying earlier, these sites have been studied for some time now, but um, every time we go back, something uh, you know, can change. Um, the other day we went and we were looking for this microbial mat, which is basically a ton of microbes, uh, kind of living in close association and kind of form a, a large uh, mat, kind of like a rug on your floor. And um, this particular site we were interested in is called the Mega Mat. Um, and when we went to look to find it, we, it wasn't there. It was this gi supposedly giant, large so microbial <laughs> mat and it was gone. So I think that has been like scientifically very surprising. The goal of that um, not only is the um, site very dynamic, um, our uh, scientific sort of um, projects can become dynamic too. Um, things change at sea. We prepare a lot before the cruise with the expectation that things will change really dynamically. Um, things can break, things can be fixed, obviously. Um, but also new projects can arise really uh, quickly over dinner tables um, as we find new things um, through. So it's a very much of an evolving process throughout um, uh, the cruise. Well, what happens next? Sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, of course. <laughs> but when when you get back, when you get so what? You you must be racking up to dos uh, for when you get back. What's what's on some of your lists? What does this cruise mean to you when you get back to shore? Well, there's going to be processing of samples that could not have been processed or analyzed on board, right? So that could be geochemistry, pore water geochemistry, seawater geochemistry, some of the uh, beautiful chimneys that have been collected, the microbial mats, extracting DNA and setting that up for sequencing. I'm sure the engineers have quite a bit of data to be crunching. And of course, the plastics, That's that's got to also be really interesting. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do here, but um there's a limit and at that point then we need to take that all home process it talk to each other about the results think about what the those results mean and ultimately write them up and hopefully make them publicly accessible to everyone that actually contributes to this right it makes this happen and i think uh, uh so a lot of folks placed a lot of trust in us as grad students to collect samples for them and get them started at, you know in a project pipeline for them so 
um, I think the next step for a lot of those samples is to also link up with those folks and make sure that we're all on the same page as far as what's going to happen with those samples. Um, and I think that's going to be also a fairly exciting process because that's also how preliminary data for other cruises in the future or other locations in the future uh, sort of get pumped out. So um, there's a lot of excited people anxiously waiting to see how their grad students did and and asking favors and collections. So <laughs> that will be fun. Um, any of you have any other cruises on the on the calendar? I I have one I think scheduled for this summer in the Santa Barbara Basin. Oh, okay, close to home. <laughs> Is it also on the Ravel or on another ship? I believe it'll be on the RV Atlantis, and I think if everything goes well with Alvin and its repair, uh, we'll be using Alvin on that cruise. Okay. We just lifted Alvin off the ship today. So we'll be taking okay. a look at it. Anybody else? I think it's yeah. a little tough right now, pandemic, to, to know yeah. how these cruises play out. But I think if an opportunity arises, we'd all you know try to go. Okay. We're winding down here. Uh, is there anything else you guys wanted to add? Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I imagine that's for the folks. Uh, you, you're extending that inv invitation to all the family members who are signing in for you guys. Um, all right. I want to thank you guys for um, for spending this time with us. This has been really really enlightening to see what the what life is like on a research vessel on, on, at sea for you now three weeks you're going on three weeks or yeah mm -hmm. starting the third week i think yeah okay it's been a year i know <laughs> i know it, it looks it feels that way when you think back about everything that's happened it's like wait a minute was that on this trip yeah. <laughs> has anyone told you about doc rock on my first cruise. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Tell them about that. <laughs> For those who don't know, it's the phenomenon where when you get onto stable ground, you still are moving. Um, <laughs> dock rock. Yeah. I, I think it just broke their hearts, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.